Okay, I guess it's uh, five of the hour, so I will go ahead and get us going. Thank you for uh, coming to attend. Um, very happy to uh, have a, a chance. I will beg your indulgence a little bit. So this uh, talk was originally gonna be 20 minutes. It would have been a, a very compact and structured, I would have been flying through things in that amount of time. Um, I was given the chance last week to, uh, to stretch it out, so I, I do have 40 minutes. I, I will you know, potentially wrap it up a little early, maybe leave time for discussion or questions, but um, I, I think it'll actually, I'm hopeful that it'll be a good thing and, and a use of, good use of your time, because I think it'll allow us to expand on the topic a little bit, but um, I, so, you know, from a, from a topic perspective, I'm gonna talk about software factory, talk about maturity, talk a little bit about our Lockheed Martin experience, uh, what we've done over the past several years in um, establishing a software factory initiative, in working across you know, many different programs, very heterogeneous, and some of the experiences that we've had, and then, I'll, and then I'll, I'll show you some of the maturity model that we're currently using in order to help programs and, and program teams to uh, you know, decide what to work on next, to decide what to improve next. Um, so let me just kick off with a little bit about our Lockheed Martin Software Factory and, and just some stats. So you can see there on the left, um, you know, 140,000 CI builds an hour, um, you know, probably more CI than CD. It's, you know, somewhat challenging in our business to, uh, to get all the way out to CD, but at least in many cases we're uh, just de deploying to um, virtual environments, to lab environments, uh, that kind of thing, and as automated a fashion as we can. Um, so, you know, that's a big number, but that's actually, of course, our, our single largest instance, which is uh, used for US development and is in AWS GovCloud. We have a smaller instance on the un that's, that's also on class that is, um, you know, we use for global collaboration. Um, and then we have, uh, of course, you know, many different instances in classified environments, right? So it kind of doesn't capture the full scope, but that's a, it's a pretty big number. The, um, the one then that I, I included for this presentation, because um, they're really starting to see a, a tick up with this number, is the number of uh, merges that we have that are automated through the use of Renovate. Uh, so that's basically a background process that detects that a given third-party library is um, behind version. Uh, it creates a branch, uh, updates a package.json file or a pom.xml or what have you to, uh, to bring in the latest version of that dependency runs whatever pipeline is associated with that project as part of a merge request. And in a number of our projects, as long as that particular pipeline works correctly, um, we go ahead and just auto merge that. Uh, so obviously that's a, you know, it's a big change for us from a more traditional model where kind of every, every code change and especially every version change of a dependency would be inspected and regression tested to, you know, to hack. Um, you know, it's, a, it's I think a big, I think, but a welcome change for us uh, in terms of being able to move to, to that kind of, of speed. Along the bottom, um, so we have an, we have an enterprise uh, free and open source software uh, database that we maintain. Um, so whenever, so we, we've established a set of proxies uh, that sit in between us and the typical internet repositories. Uh, so our software developers pull through those proxies. Whenever, the, whenever our system sees a new project or a new version, um, it does an asynchronous background, uh, finds the source code for that thing, pulls it down, does a scan, primarily for license identification, um, but it also then checks against various databases for, for things like vulnerabilities. Um, and then that leads into what has been a big effort for us uh, which is the push toward really having a better understanding and a lot more information about our software supply chain. So as you can see there, we have an open source project called Hopper. I went and pulled the, the PyPy stats for it and we're, we were up to 145,000 uh, downloads, which is not too bad uh, for a relatively new project. Um, but this is a, a, a neat piece that's part of a larger strategy. Um, we're working with uh, the OpenSSF, working with um, folks like uh, TestifySec to uh, put in place a complete software supply chain solution. In this case, Hopper is one part of that and what it does is enables the use of the SBOM uh, to bundle up 
a set of third-party dependencies, Git repositories, container images, et cetera, um, so that we can carry that across into an air-gapped environment. And the value of having, of basing that off of the SBOM is, you know, that absolute transparency of exactly what's inside. So that, you know, we know much better than we, we ever have, like what's moving across the air gap into our classified environments. Um, what ultimately what we're delivering to our customers, you know, not just tracking the top level dependencies, which is, um, it's hard to go beyond just the top level dependencies if you're in Excel. Uh, so I think that's a, you know, kind of a big, big move for us. But you know, we're obviously here to talk about maturity, right? So it's fair to say, is any of that, does any of that represent maturity? Or like, what do these statistics actually mean? I mean, 140,000 is a big number. Um, all of those have Ks after them, right? Ks make numbers big. Um, it's some amount of scale, right? So, you know, 140,000 builds every, every day, that's, that's scale. Uh, and that's maybe, I guess, a kind of maturity all by itself. Uh, scale is challenging. It, it certainly was for us to get that particular uh, Git repository, that GitLab instance, to the point where it could handle the number of continual day-on-day day pushes and pulls, the number of continuous builds that have to get kicked off. Um, you know, it's continually spawning EC2 instances, running containerized builds, tearing those EC2 instances back down, recycling them. Um, so that's a lot of work. Um, that's tooling maturity, at least. It's maybe an indication that there's a lot of adoption, right? So you've got 50,000 repositories, you've got over 20,000 distinct users that have clicked the you know, SSO sign-in button on GitLab at least once, and therefore have an account in, the, in there. Um, so that's you know, at least breadth of adoption. Uh, but I don't think any of that really qualifies as like, true practice-based maturity, right? I don't think you could look at this and say, Boy, that's that's you must have a mature software factory. You know, you just you know maybe it's just hey, you know, you are an awfully big company. Um, so you know, kind of moving on from that, then we could say like, well, what what did the process look like by which you got there? And you know, I kind of had fun thinking through this as I, I kind of went back in time when when I and a number of us started on this journey, right? If I go back, you know, even before 2018, my job prior to that was a software lead for one of our programs where we were, we were faced with an enormous challenge delivering new versions of our software into our um, integration formal test lab, right? We were looking at like 40 hours to get the, the latest version stood up if we did it, everything from scratch, um, manual process, a 100-page Word documentation, piece of Word documentation, Yes, there were a bunch of bash scripts, but you know, there would always be the thing that you forgot to do that you'd then do manually, and then you'd hope you remembered to go put it in the scripts for next time, and inevitably some things would be forgotten. We were able to introduce infrastructure as code into that project and go from 40 hours to two, uh, and it worked. Uh, and that made a big difference, right? Because it allowed us to introduce dynamically spun up virtual environments for automated regression testing. You know, they just opened up the realm of possibilities. And if you look across Lockheed Martin in like the 2018 timeframe, there were a bunch of us across the corporation that were doing similar things on different programs. We started to get together and we said, there aren't enough of us who are engaged in this, who are expert in the tools and technologies, who understand the approaches to where we can afford to be duplicating effort. So, you know, we really got to get together on this. And of course, you know, within that same time frame, you had the Defense Science Board report, you had the Defense Innovation Board study uh, that was saying, you know, not just using the term DevOps, um, which I, I, that was a hill that I died on for, you know, a while before I finally started switching to say DevSecOps, and remind myself that that's what we call it now. Uh, in just in our, mostly I think in our industry. Um, but, uh, you know, also we had this new term software factory and it's like, well, the Defense Science Board said, you, you gotta have a software factory. Um, the swap study, you know, said, hey, let's have software factory. So we're, of course, you know, what do you do in that instance? There's no mill standard, there's no STANAG, there's no ISO standard for software factory. So you look at what you do. Well, what are we doing already? Which ones of our projects seem to kind of have it together? And, uh, Let's, like, we're just gonna call that our software factory, right? So this, this group of us from across Lockheed Martin, we get together and we say, well, what are our, jointly, what, are, what do we think are some best practices? Let's call that the foundation of our, of our software factory. Um, and it was interesting at the time, 
because you had some companies that were taking the approach of saying, well, I have these 15 programs that seem to be doing it well. They have a high level of automation. So you know, my advertisement to my customer is I have 15 software factories. Um, and we took the opposite approach. We said, no, we're going to have one software factory. Uh, there just are going to be different instances of it out into classified environments, right? Because we thought that sounded better from a marketing standpoint. And, and somehow, through some kind of hypostatic union, all these software factory instances would share in the substance of the one Lockheed Martin software factory. Now, it would be fair to say, hey, you, you know, you have this ship-based combat system in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, it's mostly written in Java. You have this uh, work going on for like avionics and mission computer in Fort Worth, Texas, or at least that's where it's integrated, uh, mostly C and C++. They don't share environments, different closed areas. They don't share any code. Um, in what sense is that one software factory, right? And that would, be, that would be a fair criticism. And we were all struggling with that at that time frame. You know, we were all looking forward to the, what is the future going to be like for software development uh, in the government space, is it going to be true that software is going to be under, a, under, under its own contract in order to give us contracting flexibility to get an MVP out in three to six months? Um, is it going to be the case that software development is all going to happen inside a government-owned infrastructure, a government software factory, um, and that's how we're going to get to like genuine, you know, to the warfighter continuous deployment? Um, and then what does that mean for companies like ours where you know, much of the work that we do as software engineers is very closely tied to systems engineering, hardware, mechanical, electrical, um, where we're working very closely with those other engineering disciplines in order to produce uh, a complex system. We didn't know the answer to any of those questions. Um, and so we were, you know, we were very much at sea. But ultimately, I think this wasn't a bad decision. We said, well, we, we probably can't control those things. We don't know what's going to happen with the, you know, we, we see these changes to the FAR. We don't know what's going to happen with those. We see these initiatives like um, Platform One that we're, you know, we can definitely see the, the value in and we even, you know, to this day continue to, uh, to support and, and, you know, reuse products from. Um, we say we don't know where that's going, but, you know, we also know that there are things that are within our scope of control. There are things we can do on the programs that we have where we don't have to wait for new contracting language. We don't have to wait for the next generation of the system. Um, and so let's, let's just start doing those things. And those things ended up being very tool-based, and this kind of brings us into the 2021 timeframe, um, where we said, okay, yes, it's very tool-based, but it's tool-based from the sense that, you know, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us, you know, that, that old cliche. We, we're confident that if we can get our software teams thinking in the context of these new tools, thinking in the context of commonality when it comes to pipelines, thinking in the context of turning things over to the automation rather than trying to do any of the build or deployment steps themselves, um, that we'll start to create the kinds of behaviors that we ultimately want to see. And we had, again, you know, some success. Um, I would say you know, widespread adoption of common CI CD pipelines. But I've still I've worked my way around, and I've used more than 10 of your minutes, and I still haven't, like that's still, that's still not maturity, right? That's like, it's just, that's still, again, that's just adoption. So that really brought us to, well, like what is, what should maturity start to look like? Like well, how do we go beyond this and, and really start to, to think about maturity? Um, and, you know, so, so let's, let's, let's kind of back that up a little bit and let's talk about that. The way that I like to think about it, and I'll really genuinely get into maturity now, is I'm going to start about talking, I'm going to start talking about metrics and then I'm going to bring us back to actions. So if I'm going to start talking about metrics in the software factory DevOps space, of course I am going to start with the, with the door metrics, right? So, you know, this, these, there's, there's a reason why we keep going back to these. Um, for one thing, they have this really neat structure where you have two metrics focused on speed, two metrics focused on quality, um, but you also have this really beautiful interlocking of all of these metrics. You know, the, my um, mean time to repair is going to be bottlenecked by, almost controlled by, how fast my deployment frequency can be. You know, but if I want to speed up my deployment frequency, am I going to cause increases in my change failure rate? 
you know, am I, you know, am I, if I don't have the right things in my pipeline or if I don't have the right, um, you know, m human collaboration on the changes that I'm making, and I'm, am I going to start to see unexpected regressions? Am I going to start to see high priority PRs? Am I going to start to see failures in my, in my deployment automation? And that obviously says, okay, well, if I'm spending more of my time on repair, I'm spending more of my time fixing failed changes, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm no longer spending that time on new functionality and all of a sudden there's a push, you know, like a, a negative push on my change failure rate, on my, um, I'm sorry, on my cycle time. So then we kind of tie them all together, right? But then there's the other side of that, which is kind of that virtuous circle where I say, if I can affect one or more of these, start to affect them positively, um, I can start to see positive impacts on the others, right? So they're this, this beautiful set of metrics that kind of interlock and work together. Um, and they have the advantage, like I said, at the bottom there where they're, you know, they're pretty straightforward to measure. Um, you know, I don't think that any of us as an industry agree on what does cycle time mean in the context of a DOD program. Um, there's probably different definitions. Does it start just at contract award? Um, does it start when you get through critical design through a critical design review? If you have a traditional PDR CDR structure, um, you know, is there some other milestone where you can say, okay, we're we're officially turning this over to the engineering team to build it? Um, when's it done? Is it only when it's when it's being used by the warfighter, or is it once it's passed uh, qualification tests? Um, you know, but it does that, that almost doesn't matter. Um, and, and, you know, similarly for the other three, like those disagreements almost don't matter because for any given program, you can pick something plausible that, and this is where we get into meaningful, things ultimately that the, the customers care about, right? Whether it's the program office customer or it's the end user customer, things that those customers care about. Um, and you can find that in each one of these metrics. And so as long as we're okay with, you know, maybe not being able to compare across our programs because we recognize that, you know, our, our programs are very different from each other. Um, and what, you know, what works well or what is considered good cycle time for an IT program that is only delivering to, only delivering to a classified data center, uh, you know, is maybe different from, so, you know, something that's delivering to, say, a boomer that, you know, is away for six months under the, under the ice pack and, you know, doesn't have anything other than uh, ELF to uh, communicate home during that period of time, right? So maybe deployment frequency looks different in those cases, but maybe we're okay with that. So that's good, right? We'll start with this set of metrics, and we think that for any given system, we probably can come up with a meaningful set of metrics. Um, but then what do you do about it? If I say, like, here are your stats right now. You know, we just said it might be a little bit challenging for you to know what good is. It might be a little bit challenging to know which one of those is the one that is most in, in most need of improvement. Um, but let's say you work, work through that at some level. It's like, then what do you, what do, you do about it? Um, and so I think it's helpful to then take a step back and say, in the context of a software factory, so leaving aside the, the contracting issues or the, um, you know, the kind of qualification test issues or the depot test, operational test kinds of issues that, that can cause these things to drag out. Like just in the context of a software team, like what are some things you can do that start to affect these metrics? And I think the way to start is to maybe look at some second order metrics. Um, so these start to get into the traditional things that you see as a software team, right? These are the things that we tend to, to try to pay attention to. Um, but I think that there's a value in looking at it this way because you're not just looking at, say, static analysis findings in a vacuum and saying, well, what's the ideal number? It's zero. Um, so, you know, what are we going to try to do? Well, we maybe can't get to zero, but we're going to try and get as close as we can. Well, how close is close enough? I don't know. Um, you know, you're looking at it in, in the context of, is that having an impact on my change failure rate? Am I seeing things that come out as a result of these static analysis findings? Can I detect something that is actually like, okay, this is not just a, this is not just a static analysis finding, it's potentially a memory leak, you know, and I have a test that demonstrates that it's a memory leak and therefore I need to fix it. Um, and it also helps you to prioritize. If um, you are at the point where your test code coverage is high, and we always, we always struggle on programs with like how, how high is high enough, um, you know, then 
if it's good, I guess I would say, you know, if, is it good enough that when you run those tests, you're not seeing a significant number of escapes so that when you get to the next phase of integration testing, you're not suddenly seeing issues that could have been caught you know, in, the, in more of that unit or component test level, right? So it, kinda, it helps to kind of focus the attention, I think, a little bit on, on places where it could potentially be. Um, and I think that that is the biggest difference between this kind of way, maybe the DevOps way of thinking about metrics versus what I would call the traditional CMMI way of thinking about metrics, right? Where you established a baseline and then you put it under statistical control so we wouldn't want our, um, you know, we don't want our number of PTRs to go up significantly, but we also don't want it to go down significantly because that, that's not under statistical control. Um, and then once you've established that control, then you can start to find ways to optimize, right? Instead of thinking like that, let's start with a set of metrics over here on the right that we genuinely have a positive direction for. We genuinely know how they can get better. And then let's use the second order metrics to drive which ones should get better and drive how they should get better. Now, obviously that, thing on the left is not exhaustive. I crammed a bunch of stuff in there that I had room for without making the print too small. Um, so you could probably think of another 30 of those. But I think there's value as you think of those other metrics, like how do I tie these back to the things on the right? Um, and you know, what, can I make that connection that, that actually improves something that's meaningful to the customer? Um, and then going one step beyond, I think there's also value in talking about specific behaviors. So I tried to make these relatively binary. You do or you don't. Um, you know, some of these might be controversial. Do you do you want a nightly build or do you want to go to you know just like hey every time I'm every time I make a change I'm gonna I'm gonna have a new build. Um, I would say you know for many of our programs let's just get to that nightly uh, and then we can go from there, right? But um, in any case, the, pr the purpose of these uh, behaviors, again, is to help teams drive the second order metrics, which then ultimately help them drive improvements in the Dora metrics. Um, and so now we start to get to the point where, yeah, if we, have, if we have software teams that are genuinely doing the behaviors on the left, they're seeing improvements in the second order metrics, we expect they're gonna to start to see improvements in the Dora metrics, you can start to say, okay, maybe this is moving beyond adoption and maybe we actually have maturity. Um, and you know, at the same time, I think we try to do it in a way that enables the, um, that enables the uh, you know, action, kind of, you know, as I say kind of at the bottom there, you know, kind of clear actionable steps that programs can take. So this is the next thing that I'm gonna do um, as I make that improvement effort. Um, so that kind of brings us to what, I, what we call our reference architecture adoption measurement model, which is a mouthful but has a great acronym. Um, we, we created five levels. Um, so you know, this, here's, the, here's the big slide. And again, summary level, um, because I wanted to uh, keep the, the text, uh, the, the typeface a little bigger. Uh, but the five levels, you, know, you see kind of go from initial on the left all the way to comprehensive on the right. Um, divide it up into people, process, and tools, because why wouldn't you? Uh, that's a, it, it does end up being a pretty effective way, I think, to think about, uh, about DevOps. And then you can kind of see, you know, as you go from the, from the left to the right, how things start to change. Um, one of the things that I think is, is great about this model, and it's one of the things I really liked about, the, about it the first time that I, I saw it, the first time it was put together, um, the, the, the traditional idea of the CI pipeline is pretty much table stakes. It's kind of all the way over on the left where it says automated builds. To some extent, it's the, you know, a little bit of that next column with static analysis and unit testing, but you, know, you pretty much have to have that in order to be able to do any of the maturing that's, that's indicated here. The other thing that I think is pretty neat about this is um, the way that it incorporates changes in your team structure. You know, like I, I said before, we try to shape our tools and then our tools shape us. But there are certain things, you know, particularly we, when we get into cross-functional teams, when we get into software and systems engineers working together on a regular basis, um, it's pretty hard to do that by just telling the software team to, you know, use GitLab and use GitLab CI pipelines, um, right? You, you need other kinds of changes on the program. You need other ways of encouraging them to, to think in these terms. And so, you know, that's something that uh, we, we try to encourage more directly through a measurement model like this. You know, the other thing is, you know, this is tied, of course, to the previous charts that we saw um, where, you know, each one of these behaviors that we're trying to drive 
uh, we are expecting to see improvements in metrics. And that lets us come at it from the perspective of like, what is the most important thing to your customer? What is the next thing you should work on? Um, not just trying to get everybody all the way to the right all at once, but uh, giving them priority and uh, giving them an order in which to do some of the work. Um, the, the other thing, uh, one last thing I'll say about it that I think is, is also kind of neat is that I think it also does a good job of tying in um, not just insights from DevOps, not just insights from like traditional DOD IPTs and some of those things, but also insights from um, traditional Agile as well. Um, you know, reducing uh, batch sizes and that kind of thing. Yes, sir. Uh, just one thing on your automated builds over there. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll I'll repeat that for the for the stream. Um, so there was a really good point that you know what we're what you see, and I think SBOM is a perfect example of this. You see um, maybe the the environment that you're working in, the just the repository tool, the GitHub or GitLab, um, will start to generate SBOMs for you automatically. So maybe you don't even need to. You just need to opt in to to an existing bit of automation, um, and that tends to pull that to the left. Um, you know that's that is a, that's an excellent point. We've uh, our experience was was somewhat similar to that because we'd had that uh, that good adoption, you know, around like the 2021 timeframe uh, of getting teams onto a common set of CI pipelines. Uh, when it was time for us to introduce SBOM tooling broadly across Lockheed Martin, uh, we were able to go in and add it to those common pipelines, and in a consequence, you know, we just kind of saw. Exactly as you said, like teams just automatically jump to that third level if they were using our common pipelines. It was a, a really powerful um, incentive for teams to say, yes, the you know the CISA, the White House CISA DoD ultimately is is going to start to demand S bombs with delivery. Um, we are putting in a requirement that you have to generate an S bomb to to have ready to deliver to your customer. Um, but we are also bringing along the automation that will do that for you. And if you're using our common pipelines, then you already have it. Uh, and that was, I think, I think that was that was pretty powerful, and it did show that um, way of you know using adoption to to drive maturity at least at the tools level. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of before I open it up for questions, I'll just kind of close with this this one idea. So you you heard me talk about um, some ideas of. You know, you know what is what is your customer's priority, right? If we look across the Dora metrics, does your customer care more about getting you know getting deliveries of of new capability more frequently, um, or resolving you know information assurance or vulnerability issues more frequently? Um, that was a, that was one of the biggest drivers on that program I talked about, where we had to introduce infrastructure as code. One of the biggest reasons was you know, a serious dissatisfaction from our customer over how long it was taking us to migrate to you know non-vulnerable versions of third-party libraries. Right, so we just we we knew we had to fix that. Or does your customer care more about uh, you know something like change failure rate, uh, right? Where it's just like we we need to be certain before something gets into the production environment that. You know, we, we're confident that it's that it's not going to create regressions, that it's not going to break existing working behavior. Um, you know, different customers have obviously a balance of those priorities, uh, and that drives, you know, not just the the way that you structure your program, but it also might drive what you think of as good enough in terms of, you know, this a metric in a given area, and therefore, you know, how you go about improvement. Um, you know, it's 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 challenging. Uh, it's been challenging for us as we try to encourage programs across Lockheed Martin to adopt software our, our software factory capabilities and then mature those because we we are often in the position of having to say, including to leadership, um, we don't know what the right adoption approach is for any given program until we have a chance to sit down and talk with them. But we still think that there's enormous value in having that conversation because every program is starting from a different place. And because every program has different customer with different priorities, um, the also the other thing that plays into that is just this idea of focus. Um, it's just not possible, you know. In our in our experience, like we we can't come in and just you know one software factory please, and just introduce it that way to our programs. Um, it has to be a process of where are you now? What is the the one thing that you can change that you'll see positive results within you know not a not a year not six months. 
three months, hopefully a month. Um, and you can, because you're going to create buy-in within your program for doing more, um, but also because if we just pick those one or two things and you can focus on them, then they'll actually get done, they'll actually get improved. Um, and then kind of thirdly, you know, at the very beginning I talked about one of the biggest challenges that we faced back in 2018 is we were each doing our own separate DevOps thing and we all had to come together as an organization. So there weren't enough of us, there still aren't enough of us. There still aren't enough people across our organization that, that get this stuff, that are experts in the technology, that, uh, that understand the, the right way of doing things. Um, and so, you know, I, I showed a bunch of metrics at the very beginning, where I talked about the scale of our software factory. I talked about you know 100,000 builds a day or whatever. But you know maybe the most important metric, kind of playing into this idea of of intrinsic improvement of teams that are able to identify their own improvements and improve themselves, um, is the the community that we have built within Lockheed Martin. Right? If I were going to describe our Lockheed Martin software factory, maybe the best thing I could do is just say. You know, I just looked at our channel and there are almost 3,600 people that are in that channel that are posting, that are responding, that are helping each other. You know, so it's not a matter of, of you know, here is the dictate that comes down from on high of how you do things, but it's people working together in order to improve. So I hope that was helpful. I hope I got across the idea that, um, you know, I, I've enjoyed this journey that we've gone on. I think we've made software development and delivery and DoD better. Um, I, I think we, we, we've learned a few things by doing it wrong in some cases. Um, but I also feel like, you know, we kind of, I would say we, Lockheed Martin, and I'm, you know, I, I'm sure the, the rest of the community, we kind of feel like there's plenty more to do, right? And so, you know, I hope, I hope this was useful from the perspective of, hey, here are some things that, that maybe look like software factory maturity, you know, still not to the level of a mill standard or a stanag, but um, at least to the level of, like, we, we, could, we could use this to get better. Um, but also, you know, like, this is a journey that we're definitely on, and, and we appreciate the chance to, to learn from the community as well. Yeah. Thank you. I've, I have left just under 10 minutes out of my original schedule, so you'd be, uh, sure, go ahead. Um, so in maturity and, and back to the, the dev science board on software factory, I mean, one of the big advantages was that transparency and we saw through the government's effort to stand up internal software factory, you get that transparency across the government contract boundaries. In terms of Lockheed and how are you balancing that Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. I, I think we've definitely seen a movement toward um, you know our customers wanting at least government purpose and ideally unlimited rights on things. And I think some of that is that transparency. Some of it is just the um, you know just a strong a feeling that it is going to make MOSA efforts easier, modular open open systems architecture efforts easier. Um, and some of it just, you know, getting getting tired of cases where they feel like they're locked into a vendor, um, which is understandable. I don't I don't like being in that situation either when when we buy. So it's it's almost a level where we we end up only talking about from from our perspective as the you know because we tend to be in the lead system integrator prime contractor kind of position. Um, we're only talking about a very small piece of our of, of any of our software baseline that is actually restricted rights that we maybe aren't offering for that. And so for, for us, the, the distinction between government software factory or government operated infrastructure versus, versus contractor has really been more about the, the kinds of beneficial interactions that you have to balance between the government evaluators who are going to let you deliver something out to production versus the other engineering disciplines that you know, maybe aren't in that same kind of, kind of government infrastructure environment. Um, and that's the perspective that we've we've struggled with in terms of not knowing, you know, wh where where the where is the right balance between those things. Um, I will say that you know we we currently work in both of those kinds of environments, and, and to a large degree, of course, we're if our customer says, you know, hey, do your work in this in this government infrastructure, we that's what we do, right? But um, I would also say that I've seen some really great advance toward moving. Um, 
moving to a hybrid model where there's really good connectivity in between. You know, maybe we have uh, an extranet system that government can access without having to be inside our inside our intranet. Um, maybe we have a system that automatically pushes it into their repositories, um, and we're still pushing source code. Um, I, I don't know. I feel like I circled your question as opposed to answering it. I, I, I could say I'll say one more thing. When it comes to even things that are restricted rights, um, S bombs are a big move toward transparency. Um, but I don't think it quite gets what the government is really after in all cases because I do think that the government is really about I want to be able to take this thing away from you and hand it to somebody else if I don't like how you're performing on it and that's an understandable thing to want and that you know kind of the only way to get around that is like ex be extremely modular and open you know and or government purpose or unlimited rights so it just I, I think we'll, we'll all continue to have those data rights conversations sir Sure. That's a, that's a great question, so I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it. So there's, there, there, with this kind of model, there can be fatigue in moving from the left side all the way to the right side. You spent so much time um, improving, you know, what, where's, the, where's the ongoing benefit of improving and, and you know, is it taking you away from, from, from the day job of actually writing valuable software? Um, and then the other, the other part of the question was, did we therefore establish like a top down, you know, everybody has to be at least conforming and there are incentives to move to the right? And I'll answer the second question, there, no. Um, there, there is not uh, currently, in fact, I would even go so far to say is there is not currently a dashboard that tries to pull this data together for many different programs uh, in order to show like who's ahead and who's behind. Um, and, and, and some of that is because we have programs that are in, in such different life cycle phases. We didn't want to have a program that, you know, the, the customer is very sensitive to, to change in process or change in the baseline, um, and therefore there just isn't room for introducing new tools or, or, or new capabilities. Um, and we're going to, we didn't want to treat programs like that as being, you know, somehow lesser. Uh, so we, I would say we use this more as aspirational, um, as, a, as you know, pure, pure carrot, as opposed to, you know, this is, and again, it ties back to, we strongly feel like if you, as you continue to move to the right of this, you're going to do things that makes your customer happy. Like your, your customer is going to be more satisfied because you, you kept moving. If we had a team that said, yeah, I'm at the point where my customer is just no longer gonna care if I continue moving up this maturity model, then you know, we, we, we're probably at a point where we're diminishing returns. Sir? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So you know, is is basically like when you look at things that are that are maybe security requirements or um, that are kind of non-functional requirements that are as part of your software factory process, as part of your deployment architecture, how do you how do you tie those back to things that that the customer really sees as an improvement? 
Um, it is, it obviously varies. Um, you know, I've never had a customer that like doesn't that doesn't care at all about the you know things like security, transparency, the you know the the ability to get an ATO, you know all those kinds of things. But you certainly have customers that are more comfortable with exceptions and 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 risk and things like that, right? So, I think the 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 biggest driver for us has been if you put in place the right kind of automated process um, that will get you you know, that, that change control over your infrastructure, so complete infrastructure as code, that automated deployment on top, um, the pipeline that, that operates on every code change, the ability to have all of the, you know, embedded security, the shifting security left, the putting it into the process becomes much easier. And so you can kind of, it's the kind of thing where if you do the right things, then the kind of work that, that we're doing while still challenging to get, like you said, all the way to being able to you know, at, do attestation for every single step in your build, it's a heck of a lot easier if you've done the right things to do a pipeline than if you haven't. And if you've done the right things to do a pipeline, you're gonna see benefit from that that is more directly attributable to the Dora metrics. I, I think we're new enough generating enough S bombs across our programs that um, I don't know maybe that's will be a, an Ian question for afterwards but I'm not aware of any but the one thing I will say flipping around the other way I ex when we put out the requirement that said we expect all of our our development teams to start generating S bombs um, I expected a lot more resistance to that than we got um, because it's it's not common in Lockheed Martin to put kind of corp you know at the corporate level to establish requirements at that level of detail. Um, we got a lot less than I expected that we would. So I think um, it, was, it was almost, I think the, the, the area of software supply chain, both because of things that have been in the news um, and because of the, the kind of work that we do as an industry, I think it was an area where it was just, of, of course you need this, right? And so we, we've, it's been, it's been easier to introduce those those kind of demands into our, our systems than you know maybe it would have been in, in in other industries or maybe other demands would have been. Sir. So I, don't know, I, I do like this model, and I, I would have, I would add, you know, one of the things that I, I talk about a lot uh, or preach a lot is the need to apologies for well, apologies and and how the basically Thank you. That, that's great feedback. Thank you. Yes, sir. So one thing I would uh, recommend is, uh, and perhaps you have this in some of your other material, is like as a firm moves forward, like from an initial to comprehensive, like this stuff gets deployed somewhere, and eventually it would be excellent to have a, a linkage of where something went, as in I deployed something. Uh, what is the inventory of all the places where this thing is deployed, and also went back the opposite direction? I have a That's, that's great, thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, um, we, we collectively, I think on the, within the, the DOD space, um, I think we, we, we understand that the, the build time S-bombs that we're generating right now, 
um, at, at some level, there's going to need to be traceability to you know this particular tail number at this particular forward operating base is you know got this particular set of software on it, um, and it's so it's it's a little bit um, there's there's going to be challenges with with how that data is collected, how it's aggregated, how it's shared um, that that we're going to have to work together and solve. Well, and that won't be the build desktop. That'll be a deployed and installed desktop. Right. What you actually put there? Yeah, I, I, I think, I think it has the, I think it has the opportunity. Like the things that we were trying to do with a functional configuration audit traditionally, like the, w what we were, what we were trying to do there, we can do so much better in so much more detail with, as you said, the installed or the um, deployed S bomb. Um, yeah, but and, and CISA is now standardized those things. Right. So that people quit talking to each other. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, I wrote. I, I mean, I have it in my I have it in my notes from uh, from Monday's session. There is for anybody that didn't see that, there was a really good kind of um, circle chart that that showed like for all of the phases of the traditional software development lifecycle or the DevOps cycle, like where the different S bombs kind of play in. Well, I have uh, used up my time, and I think I should be letting you go to a coffee break. Uh, thank you so much for again coming. Thanks for the the fabulous feedback, and uh, you know just. It's uh, great to have a chance to present to you. Thank you.